Uh, I think we're live. I think we are live. Um, please let me know if you can hear us if when someone gets in the chat. <laughs> Um, let me know if the audio is okay. Perfect. Good. good. Okay. All right. We're having, as always, technical issues, but we're two minutes early. <laughs> so I did nothing today but get ready for this uh, live stream. And my makeup's done. Aren't you guys proud of me? Um, although the lighting could be a little closer. Can't be perfect. Okay, hello. It's Madam Posh with the MP Experience with my gentleman, John Mystic. Uh, we are here for this week's vlog and live stream. Uh, we will be answering your questions. If you have questions in the chat, feel free to ask them. <clears throat> if you don't have questions, that is okay as well. We are also going to discuss, um, we're going to discuss tonight, uh, M mixed relationships. Okay. Did I tell you about this already? No. Oh well, you should have. You should have looked at the social medias. I, I don't do this. <laughs> we are going to talk about black and white people relationships, um, and it may not be politically correct, as you know, I tend to not be. But uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about that, and then we're also going to talk about I had to um, I had to cut rope for my first time from a suspension this week. So we're going to discuss that, and then we'll answer any of your questions. And if we have any, uh, if we get through those topics really quickly, which we'll see what happens, uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about fire because I know we didn't get a chance to finish that last week. I am also going to do just kind of like an overview video for fire, um, probably one that I can like organized, not a live stream. Uh, so you guys get a little idea of what's going to be going on. And then we will be driving there. And so we will probably vlog our video vlog, um, our drive and our weekend trip, some mm -hmm. of our rope. And, um, and then we'll do a rehab after the convention where we talk about how the convention went. And uh, yeah, so that's probably what we got going up for. That is the what weekend? Uh, not next week, the week after. Since I don't know the exact dates off the top of my head, but it's totally okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, okay, sorry. So I had um, my rope top was explaining to me a, a box tie that he taught in our rope class and I need to do a video on it. So I need to know which pattern that he did. And he had mentioned um, that uh, I needed to do water maze going up over the shoulder. And I, for the life of me, could not remember what the fuck a water maze was. And we could not find it anywhere because we're probably spelling it incorrectly. Uh, and so as uh, I text him to be like, hey, I'm having a rope brain fart. Can you please uh, explain more what you mean by water maze up over the shoulder? And then while uh, I was waiting for him to text me back, I had told my partner, my partner, I told him, yeah. <laughs> um, I told him, you know what I think it is? I think it's the opposite of Munter Hitches. And I was like, I feel like that's come up before, but I just haven't you heard a lot of people use that term in other education. And lo and behold, I was right. <laughs> so the water maze going up, the reverse Munter Hitches. So I was right. Sorry, just had to share the little, the little successes in life, you know, they make you really happy when your brain was, was working properly. Okay. Let's pause for one moment. No, actually we're not going to pause. We're going to give you the first question, Alexander. Oh, Alexander, we're going to start deep. What is it that attracts you to African-American women? Let's go. Um, well, I love, well, one, I love the dark skin, uh, obviously. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard to ever describe why you like a certain type. You know, why do I like high cheekbones? Why do I, why do some people prefer, you know, redheads? I'm not sure if there's a, 
a, a reason other than just it's <clears throat> I don't know. It's a good question. Is it just something that I've come to enjoy because a lot of my relationships have been with black women, or is it something I've always I'm not sure it's a good question. I do love that when we hold hands, I do love the whole the contrast. The con I love yeah. the contrast. Yeah. I like it. I like the contrast as well. Yeah. I didn't always when I was younger, that was something I had I was had to get that I was like, oh, it's kind of weird. But I think that's because I was so used to seeing yeah. not seeing that. So I grew up, if you're new to me and my story, my channel, I grew up um in a very um just middle class. Uh, city with uh, adopted parents who are Caucasian uh, and I grew up around mainly Caucasian people <laughs> uh, not mainly absolutely all like 99% uh, so my experiences growing up uh, were maybe different than not maybe they were different than maybe um, you know someone who grew up in, in an all African American family and so I pretty much accredit the fact that uh, not that that's the only thing I've dated, but that I've been mostly attracted to Caucasian men in my life, to my environment, <laughs> and having nothing to do with uh, race at all. I feel like if I was raised around um, a 99% uh, uh, Korean, you know, community, I would probably be attracted to Koreans. I think that I, my... Um, I think that that has a lot to do, correlates a lot to, uh, why I've been attracted to that specific type, because it's not that I don't find all types of people attractive. Um, and it has, it, it really, at the end of the day is like, that's just where it, it would end up. And, um, again, I think that has a lot to do more with my environment and what I grew up around and was kind of like, I hate to say conditioned, but like kind of conditioned around. Um, and less to do with a race thing. Yeah, I think maybe the same way because I would think my first girlfriends were white because that's what I was around. Then I had a girlfriend that was black, and it was it was one of those blind date kind of things. And I said, oh, this this is nice. I just uh, just it was different. But then my next girlfriend, she approached me again. I you know it wasn't anything I actively sought, but again, she was black, and I guess I've just gotten to really appreciate the. The way the light shines on the skin, the the lips, you know, black women have typically fuller lips. Um, they typically have, you know, wider hips, etc. And I've just got to like these things. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, I mean, I like dark hair and blue eyes or light eyes. Mm -hmm. That from the time I was like six, I think in my journals, I that's the type of, um, of what I've been uh, attracted to. And, and oftentimes, mostly I've, I've had four major relationships in my life. And I think all of them pretty much fit that bill, except for maybe one. Um, but I think that has to do more with um, the more with that. That's just, again, aesthetically something that I'm attracted to because I like dark hair and blue eyes and like very pale skin and women as well. I'm bisexual. I like both sides and like, I like those traits in both. So I don't think it has something specifically to do. I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a race thing or again, just an aesthetic thing. Um, as you can see, I, I, I can tend to be a little goth and there's always been a little, uh, appreciation and at the same time jealousy because I wish that I could pull off that aesthetic um, certain goth aspects of it that you just can pull off better when you have paler skin um, and that has not discouraged me clearly um, but um, I think those are some reasons why I would pull those certain things out like I especially with with um, with girls like I just liked the way like heavy eyeliner looks with like light eyes and light mm -hmm. skin and jet black hair <clears throat> so yeah so that kind of goes into a little history of our dating and what we've been attracted to uh something else that I wanted to talk about is kind of the uh the reactions publicly do you have any like specific situations or stories where you've had to deal with people in public and how their views or opinions about your mixed relationship? Uh, 
I've had, I can't say I've had any negative views. Um, well, I did have a family member who was basically saying, oh, these, these relationships are condemned from the start, but that's just, <laughs> that, that's just, he was, he was a redneck. But anyway, <laughs> um, no, but typically they've all been favorable. I do get, I do recognize that I do get, we do get more stares or longer stares. Um, but ne again, negative, not a negative way. I do, I do see when other mixed couples see me when I was mixed couples that they do smile. They just say, yeah, or kind of a part of a. That is true. Yes. With other mixed couples, there's definitely a connection there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, You're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, I've had a lot. I've had much different experiences. Um, I've had positive ones as well, uh, but I have definitely had situations uh, with every every type of situation. A group of African American men, a group of you know what? Actually, to be the honest, the only group of people that I haven't really had a negative reaction from is white guys. Like I've had negative reactions from like a group of African or, you know, black guys. I've had negative reactions from black women. I've had negative reactions from white women. <laughs> um, but white guys are normally like, mm, yeah. Hmm. They're probably looking at me and they'd be like, I hate it. <laughs> now, after, now, when I say I've had good reactions, basically I, I'm the white guy in the relationship. So maybe... The people, maybe the people respond to us different. differently. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe they're loving the fact that I'm in it, but they're secretly hating on the other person. I don't know. I mean, and uh, the the other aspects, so different ones. So, like, I've had a situation where, um, or I was out with a guy who was actually just a guy friend, but he he's kind of a nerdy white guy, um, as I tend to love. And um, we're at a strip club. We're at like the in like this table that's like right in front of main stage, right in the front. And we just have the two chairs We're just in us one table. And there's a group of like six or seven black guys behind us. And every time my, my friend gets up to go tip the stages, they were kind of heckling me. Um, like being like, you know, like, why are you with him? Like, what are you doing? Do you want to have some real fun? And I just kind of kept ignoring them and, you know, or giving them some side eye or whatever. <clears throat> and then he goes up to tip the stage and they decided to steal his chair, um, which I guess was taking it to the next ag aggression level, right? They're, they didn't get, um, they didn't get enough response from me from just their heckling. And so they decided to steal his chair and um, which again, kind of just, you're poking a bear. So it, my response was when he got back, I got up and gave him my chair and then I sat on his lap and then uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I probably like proceeded to make out with him or something like that to make it worse. And they, they left. <laughs> so I think I got my point across and uh, yeah. And I left us alone, but um that's, I, I mean, I've had many different kinds of situations like that. I've had situations where I've had um, black employees of where we are at over here, uh, a, like a white family talking about me and my partner. And then they were so annoyed about what they were saying that they like, because we hadn't even heard it. We're just like living our life. Right. But they st like said something like to the people and then came and said something to us like, hey, you know. I may not do it, but we support you guys and people shouldn't be saying stuff. Um, I also live in, have lived in Texas or Florida for most of the, my adult, uh, adult lifehood uh, and spent much time working and, and um, traveling in the South. Uh, I used to work for um, a company called uh well, I used to work for a dip company and uh, I did uh, promotional marketing for them. And so we would travel to like country music festivals, like gun shows, like hunting shows, um, NASCAR races and give away free dip. And so not only have I traveled, you know, a lot over the country, but I've also traveled into like the dirty, dirty south of, <laughs> of our country where there's, um, you know, uh, not, not, not quite like dirt roads, but like where, you know, there's no Wi-Fi or, um, like 
the one of the main NASCAR races is like really like in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I've had lots of different experiences dealing with um, race in America, dating and mixed relationships um, and kind of how to deal with that. And also how to like prepare your partner for dealing with that, because um, m- most of my exes, I was the first uh, black girl that they had dated. And so trying to explain to them just certain concepts, like simple things like weave, <laughs> like when you move in with someone, ex- explaining that whole process and why you can't come home for 24 hours so I can make sure that I'm ready. Um, yeah, with me, I already knew about that. Basically, my one of my exes, I was the one who took their weave out before they went to the, the shops. So that way they save more time. Yeah, so we, I knew all we ain't about getting that. like that. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with a very, like, 1950s type of uh, philosophy mother who like wouldn't go to the mailbox without being somewhat put together. Uh, And so like, I really don't even like my partners to watch me get ready. Like it's, that's the whole, that's like supposed to be the whole like trick is that I'm this and then like I am unmakeuped and then I come out and it's like, ta-da, look at it, it's a transformation. And like you just watching the transformation makes it less magical. But also just like part of that would be like uh, you would never let your husband like see you in the like in 1952 without your hair and makeup done properly. Like um, and so, yeah, just as much as I like have, you know, fetishes for nostalgia and those types of pomp and circumstance and just cultures. I don't even know all the words for it. But, uh, you know, I also... I also like some of the, you know, traditional aspects of those cultures as well, even though I may not subscribe to them or I do, but I just taint them a little bit. (laughs) Flip the rolls or something. But um, anyway, it's totally got off topic. What was I talking about? Let's look at the chat. The chat has actually been blown up. So let's see. Uh, Silver uh, Lena. Hope I'm saying that right. Um... Welcome to the chat. Fashion lover Tiffany, welcome to the chat. Oh, question for your gentleman from Jamara. Do people wink at you? Um, like, job well done. Oh, when, I think we we're talking about uh, me being on a most. I do notice that that um, I do get more, I guess, more winks or more smiles from black women. I think in my experience, black women are more, more, is it bold or forward than white men typically? So that's probably why I get into relationships with black women easier because being, I'm not, I'm not the one who asks first. They're usually the one who asks first. And of course, black women are more likely to ask before a white woman does. And they're also more likely to say something when they see something like that. Yes. Like yes. when I've had, when I've had positive experiences and responses from African-American women about these types of relationships, yeah. it was mostly the time, mostly like a compliment to like the guy for like having the balls pretty much, which is sadly true. That is definitely culture that I grew up with. And in my twenties dating where yes, it did take a man who was willing to like, I probably have to tell a few of his friends like fuck off about the fact that she's black, especially dating in Dallas. Like that was definitely a thing. Um, oh gosh, sorry. I totally just lost my train of thought again. Um, oh, and so, but so the reactions I would get from black women were kind of commending him, uh, my partner and, and giving him like a, okay, we see you. And, and also too, like black women who were in my life and around that, or like within my circle of life would also make little notes for their future. Like if our relationship didn't work, they knew like, there's a guy that likes black girls. Uh, that is definitely a thing. Um, there was girls that I worked at the strip club that used to approach tables after I had approached them if I would uh, get a dance from them because they felt that they would be accepted as as an African American woman by that table. Um, and I guess they that I had I had I didn't ever look at or I rarely judge tables like that. And even if I did see them like that, to me it was just a challenge to get to them to like me more. Um, so I never let that discourage who I would approach. But there were girls that told me that. Yeah, you mentioned about, you know, if your relationship didn't work out, they have a, already someone in mind. It's kind of funny that when my long-term relationship in the past fell apart, within a week 
a black lady, a black woman at work approached me and, you know, was like, was, they're like waiting. They, they are. Because like some of them are not willing to go out on that limb. And it's like, this is no judgment. I get it. Some of them are just not willing to go out on that limb and say, I, like, I'll just get this guy, white guy to like me. Right. There is whether, again, this is not politically correct, correct but it is true within the African-American community and places where, <clears throat> you are raised around mostly African-American people, whether it is affluent or not, there is an underlining culture of it being a big step out to date white men. And <clears throat> girls are sometimes uh, nervous or shy to express that they may be attracted to that, even to their family. They may get some of the same, um, same, issues that the white guy does going to his family and saying that he wants to bring a black girl home or the white girl does saying that she wants to bring a black girl home. Black families put similar types of pressures on black people are their black children as well of what, what they see that they want them to marry, just like any race does. <clears throat> so taking that into consideration, like for someone who grew up in that, whereas me, I don't look at it like that because I've always been around those type of people. I've been comfortable interacting around that. If you're someone who's only grew up around African-American people and your connection or your interactions with Caucasian people is very rare or limited, then you're going to have misconceptions just like white people have about us because you're not going to understand. You're going to be ignorant about that culture. And you're going to have misconceptions. And I could see where that could also play into, um, you know, wanting to play it safe and not wanting to go, wanting to know that yeah. this person has already dated black women before and you're not the first. <clears throat> and to all those women who are uh, black women who are now dating guys that I dated first. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I mean, I don't like the like like sweetest way possible too, because there were some guys that I dated that I was like, this is never gonna work, but there's going to be black girls out there that are going to love you. Um, I'm just not the one. And I hope that this was a good icebreaker for both of them. And I hope they're very happy. I am totally okay being the person that helped other people's happiness. Now I've done my time. Now I don't want to do much more. I need to. I don't, I'm not. I don't want to prepare people for other relationships anymore. I've done my time in my twenties. But like, I'm also okay with that. Looking back, like, all right, if you, I, that's fine. It happens. What can you do? I'm happy now. So, anyways, um, I also and and then when African get, uh, American girls like or black girls respond to me about you know, in public in a positive way. Again, it's most of the time it is either something to do with uh, like you go girl, get like, you know, we're proud of you. Or it will be something like, uh, get your money, girl. <laughs> that is verbatim something another black girl has said to me <laughs> about my mixed relationship when seeing me in public with my one of my other partners. Um, and so, to me, that's always funny too. I think I, re I think I responded back and she, I mean, it was like, she snapped and everything. I'm not exaggerating. And I think I snapped back and I was like, I am. <laughs> Which was like totally not where that relationship was based, but why not? Like I was being funny. It was like random people. All right. Well, let's get back to the chat for a second. Some people can be rude. I know they can be, but you know what? That's why it's always fun to um, to be witty and sarcastic because when people are rude, you can knock them right back. You can either laugh at yourself and uh, and and move on, or again, you can just try to take it um, take it with a grain of salt, come back with something good, or make fun of yourself as well. And then most of the time, that throws them off their game, and you're back in control of the situation. Uh, that's uh, information that I learned from Charisma on Demand, another YouTube channel. You should check it out. I'm gonna talk more about them in the future. Uh, let's see. We got some people that were born and raised in the South. Oh, I don't know if I could have been born and raised. <laughs> I'm happy to live here now. <laughs> um, like, I can't go outside without putting on my face. Jamara, I feel you about that. Like, I don't necessarily have to put on my face. Um, I think I've gotten to the point where I've realized a lot of people don't notice the difference between a little bit of makeup and no makeup on me anyways, but I do always have to be put together. Like 
uh, if I even if I'm running to the grocery store, like I need to have like a cute pair of flats on, like like an outfit that looks somewhat like casual, but like put together jeans, something hat. If I don't want to do my hair, like hat. That's why I'm in hats half the time because <laughs> I don't want to do my hair. But I'm also not going to look a mess. Uh, so I, yeah, that's I don't know. That's just how I was raised. What can you do? Yeah. Nolan Baptiste, what's up? Uh, if you're still in the chat, thanks for saying what's up. Uh, and I love that you guys are like talking to each other because you remember each other from our like our last live stream chat. That like makes me feel really cool. So that's that's awesome that you guys are saying hi to each other. Um, do you see this question by Nolan? It's for you. Oh, uh, question is how do you deal with being attracted? Or attacked? Oh, attacked. being attacked. Oh, being attacked for being submissive to woman in public. Because I am, and I have problems handling, huh, not, I've never, never really experienced never that. Never experienced that. Um, Maybe what you would do if that happened. Yeah, if that, that is a really good question. Um, I have to think about it, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, my knee-jerk reaction is to play it off. Uh, if the person, if, like, like if, um, you know, if Madam Posh is there with me, I think I probably wouldn't do much because she'd probably tell. I mean, if I first. was there, yeah, no, I'd probably handle it. <laughs> so, but if if I'm not there, which is actually more likely to be, um, I don't know if you can give us more context, Nolan, of maybe the situation that you're specifically going through, and then we can maybe try to um, give you some yeah. advice on that specific situation since he hasn't personally dealt with that? Because, I mean, they've done studies that show that I think 45% of men wish they were in the, either in the bottom position or the submissive position in many relationships. So it's, I, I think a lot of it, too, is, is just education yeah. of the public, is that the public, it, because of vanilla, toxic masculinity cultures, um, the public is not aware that a lot of men that are displaying those types of behaviors are really just masking, you know, wanting to be a little bit more, um, wanting to be submissive and that it's perfectly okay. If you're submissive, like, mm -hmm. I, I think that the, the, the difference between like female submissives and male submissives is actually not that big of a percentage difference. Yeah. Um, like, like, I think you said what, 45%. Yeah. I, th I think the number of <clears throat> women who want to be truly dominant in relationships like, 30 something percent, et cetera. So, there, I mean, I think that that just shows that in humanity, there's this natural balance between those who want to be dominant, those who want to be submissive on both sides. On of both the sides sexes. of the sexes. And yep. it's just a matter of them finding each other. That's and I think really that, that, I think that some of those numbers are probably a little skewed based on who's willing to admit certain things. Yeah. Like, I think there are some women who don't understand that they would probably be very good um, and, and would get, <clears throat> would get more back from being in the dominant role than they would be in the submissive role, but have never tried the dominant role and would maybe never because they're perfectly happy where they are, but they maybe don't understand because that's just not a role that we typically go to first. Even when yeah. I was first coming into the community, I came in into um, the community in submissive roles. Um, and then again, there's a scale of dominance and submissive. Like some, some people want to be submitted submissive to the degree to where they're basically a, an object 24 mm -hmm. seven. And some just, like, you know, the person to make decisions, you know, where do you want to go for dinner? Oh, I want to go here without the whole back and forth thing. And some people just like that. So even in there, there's a dominant submissive, but it's not extreme. But some people, it's a, it's a whole scale. And it's about finding your half that matches that degree. And I, I feel like even in vanilla relationships, there's there's DS going on. It's just not explicitly discussed and explained. Yeah. It's it's maybe more unhealthy situations. But um, there are in every relationship, there are aspects where one partner is maybe more dominant than the other in certain aspects. I think they're following. Up. No one's no. gonna take it the the wrong way, Nolan. Uh, so, I mean. I am me. So my initial response to people doing that would be to tell them to fuck the fuck off. <laughs> um, um, a lot of it is if they, if they know you're doing that, then, then they know enough about you. And then you can have a conversation with them. 
basically let them know. I mean, they may still not understand, and people probably won't understand anyway. But at least know what it is that drives you to uh, chastity or to submissiveness. And if they don't understand it, I mean, there's no real way of working around it. They just aren't going to get it. And there is something to, to understand that if you decide to, it's one thing if you're, you know, you have just a play a play partner or just a relationship, and you're not, you know, wanting to be active in the community or something like that. Um, but some of your, when you decide to be, if you decide to be more open about your lifestyle, some of your friends are going to change. Yeah. Just like if you decided to come out of the closet, right? Maybe you, you know, uh, have been fighting it and finally come out of the closet, you're probably going to lose some friends. Yeah. But at the same time, you're going to gain some new ones. And those new ones are going to be better because they're going to accept you for who you are. And so if people are not willing to accept it, even after you explain, like, this is something I need and it makes me so happy, which is how I explain a lot of stuff. Like, I've, I'm have i I'm in a healthy, emotional, psychological um headspace. I have hope that everything is going to get better and things are going to go on tomorrow. And that's not things I've had in my life. Um, specifically, you know, but right before I was getting into kink, I had kind of a, a down couple of years in my life. Um, and so those things are so rewarding. They allowed me to have, they allow me to have the confidence to not be so concerned about all those other, other things that may not be working out perfectly. Um, which uh, again, just kind of, um, allows me the confidence to just be who I am and not worry about other people's opinions and that good feeling kind of will heal the heart of those, of those relationships you use, you lose because your life will become so rewarding. You will realize you didn't need those toxic people in your life anyways. And most of the time, if someone is not going to accept you when you found something that makes you incredibly happy, <coughs> <clears throat> they probably weren't a good person in your life in the first place. Mm -hmm. And finding that out is just, again, a good push that you probably need to getting somebody toxic out of your life. That isn't um, fueling yeah. positivity. And and if you're in a relationship with a dominant, you know, tell, tell her the, him or her these things and, you know, open your heart to that person. And that itself will become a healing thing because mm -hmm. one, if you're submissive, then you also want to submit your heart to that person as well. If, if you're in a loving romantic relationship, I'm not sure what your DS relationship would be, but um, that way they can become an umbrella for you. They can become um, a haven for you, a, a sanctuary if you want. And um, that can become a part of our dynamic. Anytime you're suffering on the outside world, you turn to them and you deepen your submission to that person through your suffering. Um, if that makes sense. Yes. As long as you're doing it in a, yeah, psychologically healthy way. Healthy way, yeah. I mean, if you're being physically abused or really horribly abused, then you really need to remove yourself from that situation. Yeah, so, yeah. As long but as you're it, in a but healthy it, situation. But this is just sneers and all that. Then turn to your dominant and basically give your heart to that person. Um, but yeah, if it, if it's too much, then yeah, try to find a way of removing yourself from that situation. Also, find some community of other submissives. So if those are people that are friends in your life, you need to now find other friends that are interested in things you're interested in. Just like if your interests change from, you know, golfing every Sunday and now you want to go to Harry Potter conventions, your group of friends is going to change. You're going to have to have more friends around you that enjoy talking about Harry Potter or you're going to go crazy, right? So... Find other submissive males, go on FetLife, join, join um, you know, submissive men uh, groups, uh, find community within your, with, <clears throat> in your local community of other submissives and friends that you can go to so that when you have those times, you can go to them as well. And you have someone other, other than just your dominant, because that will also, also help you stay in healthy headspaces. Um, but also someone who's going to relate because I yeah. guarantee you, if you find other male submissives, they've also had times in their life or situations where they will be able to relate to what you're and going through. If they've gone through that, they might have good advice about what worked and what didn't work. And their advice would be a whole lot more, you know, practical. Yeah. And I agree with uh, Silver Lana. Um, be proud of what makes you happy. Yeah. You do you. Real friends accept you for the authentic real you. So true, Jamar. Jade Love. Hello, I'm new here. Do you have any advice on how to become a dominatrix and getting active in the BDSM community in general? Welcome, Jade Love, for your first time. Hopefully I got to your question before you um, 
left. <clears throat> um, sorry, really quick. Nolan, I see you're in Toronto, Canada. Toronto has a great kink community. So go on Fat Life and look for events in Toronto. You will definitely find things going on. Um, I know there's con kink conventions in, in Toronto that I think are on my like list of things I'd mm -hmm. like to go to. Um, sorry, but back to Jade's question. Do you have any advice on how to become a dominatrix and getting active into the BDSM community in general? Uh, first, I would say FetLife. FetLife is a place not to find dating partners necessarily directly. FetLife is a place to find events and community to meet people in real life. That is my first suggestion. If you are brand new and you are vanilla and you'd like to eventually become a dominatrix, you need to go, uh, you need to, go to classes. You need to learn um, the te technical, um, sorry, the tactical techniques of some of the basic fetishes, spanking, impacts, wax play, maybe some basic bondage or some type of rope. Um, you're going to need to be kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to being a dominatrix because you don't really know. You need to be able to fit into whatever box that your client wants because it is a niche market, but at the same time, it's not a specific it's not a very, uh, within the niche is not very specific. So it's a niche market of people who may be interested in um, paying someone for those services. But then once you get into those, that clientele, the array of things that you get asked for is going to be all over the place within uh, fetishes within BDSM. So education, 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 research, research, research. If you know where you'd like to be a dominatrix in, research who's who are successful working dominatrixes in your area, do a Google search, look at their website. If you feel like one speaks to you, um, don't feel free to send them a, um, a, a your most politest um, offering of your own services to possibly be mentored by them. And uh, you don't have to necessarily like the first message suggests like, oh, I would like this official mentorship, but, uh, you know, be polite, maybe give them a few compliments, um, make a few comments about things, specific things you notice on their webpage. So they, you come off as well-researched, not just a blanket kind of question. Um, and then just ask if you can like take them to dinner or, um, you know, have, take them to coffee, bring them a gift when you bring them to, co to coffee, ugh, when you go to dinner or take them to coffee. And uh, you have to do those kind of things to kind of get, to kind of show that you're serious in the beginning, if you really want to be mentored by somebody and it will take a little bit of time and dedication and some money and be willing to do some work, be willing to you know, clean, clean leather in her dungeon, if that means she's going to teach you or let you sit on in and on some sessions. So really the, the thing is, is to educate, 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 research, 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 be a jack of all trades, be good at a lot of different things. Um, and then also then find your niche. So, yeah. <clears throat> so be good at array of different things, but then also have the things that you're really good at, or you enjoy the most. Um, yeah, and yeah, have a good idea of why you want to do it. That's um, yeah. Is it because you actually enjoy doing it? Is it more the financial thing? At least be be honest with yourself about what your motivations are. Um, find out, you know, if you enjoy these things, be clear about what your boundaries are. The biggest thing is that when you start doing these things, you're gonna have, you're gonna have people wanting to push, push your boundaries. push your boundaries. They want you to have you do things which you're not really comfortable doing. And you have to have enough strength within yourself to say, no, I'm going to stick to this. Because, I mean, what, if you're a domination, you're going to be in charge of, of You're the, in charge of everything. Yeah. And so, therefore, if they ask things of you, you say, no. And that's, that, that's a part of it. That's a part of dominating is yeah. that you decide where it goes. Um, but, no, but be clear about what your boundaries are, about what your weaknesses are, and your strengths. And um, going with the idea that you're enjoying this with the, so the person. This person's wanting to have fun. You're wanting to have fun. And, you know. But uh, yeah, community bits important because that way you can actually see how people play. You got to see how people. That's the biggest thing yeah. about going from is is watching scenes to know what to do. Because yeah. when you first become into into being a dominant, you're going to be like, uh, how do I make a scene? What do yeah. I do? How do I make this interesting? How do I keep a client intrigued for two hours? Right. When you're just doing a pickup scene at the dungeon, if your scene is like 30 minutes long, that's fine. It takes however long it takes it. Yeah. Right. It's just a friend. If someone's paying you for two hours, you need to keep them 
entertained for that amount of time. And yeah. so uh, knowing what you're going to do next, having a plan, but then also knowing how to like pick up on the energy and go, oh, okay, this, this isn't going the direction of my plan. We need to take this another direction. Um, it, there's a, there's a lot that goes into it before you, that's not even just in the actual sessions. And then you have to also think about the business aspect behind the scenes. Do you have someone to do all your website stuff, all your marketing, all your um, copywriting for your website? I've built all those things myself. I have people that help me and my and other roommates with my writing and copywriting things, design things. Um, but I've built most of that stuff myself. And so that takes that cost out of it. But you still also need to you, you're going to have initial car start, ugh, startup cost for starting those types of businesses. Um, and then also you need to check out the um, laws uh, for different things yeah. within your area. Uh, what it's classified as, what you can get away with, what you can't get away with, how you should market it. Can you use PayPal? You know, um, exactly how you're going to go about it. And then also, unless you're going to do this, which that is completely your right, and I support all sex workers, and I am advocating for more rights for all of us uh, because I fall into that category as well, even though that's not necessarily what I do. But you're going to find this very gray area of, doming and sex work uh and do you want to cross that line so and those are boundaries and things that you need to have steadfast set in yourself before you start our out on that adventure or on that journey because if you don't have them set they will bend yeah and once you've crossed it it's hard it's, it's hard, to, hard go back. to go back you know and this is not even just talking from dom stuff i used to be a dancer so i've been in those environments before and even as a dancer at a young age i had pretty set in set in stone boundaries of things I was and was not going to do that I could be okay with and still, you know, uh, look at myself in the mirror. Um, and again, now I say that cause that, again, that's a connotation that we put on those types of things that is not with judgment for that, because at the same time, I respect anyone who wants to do that. And, um, <clears throat> if it was legal and regulated and, um, and, women could have more power over it, I would support that in our country, right? But I, uh, the way that it is now, it uh, unfortunately mainly benefits men. And so that is that is my biggest hang up with um, sex work, prostitution, porn, lots of, lots of those different industries is that I support them 100%. I just want women to kind of take more ownership and be making more of the profit from our own bodies. Um, and so, yeah. Um, let's see. So, uh, Jade Love, hopefully that answered some of your questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me directly um, at the MP experience at gmail.com. Uh, anyone that is an open thing. If you have any questions, feel free to email me directly and I can give you more specific answers for your situation. Um, let's see. Absolutely. It's so important to find people that accept you for you. I think I repeated that, but it's such a good line. I had to say it twice. Um, let's see. Classes, classes, classes. It's like kinky school. Yes, that's pretty much. Hopefully someday I'll have one. <laughs> I'll have a kinky school for the gifted. <laughs> um It so sounds like a really involved interview where you hope to get a mentor instead of a job. Yes, yeah. pretty much for a, yes, <laughs> it is. Um, because uh, someone mentoring you is volunteer work for that person. And when it comes to um, doms, uh, pro doms, I mean, everything is kind of, not everything, but uh, tribute is a big aspect of it. That's what they consider the payment is, is more tribute than than being paid for services necessarily. And you're that's basically what you're doing is that you're showing like, hey, I understand that this is something that takes time out of your busy schedule and day and I'm not a paying client. And so I would like to, even though I'm not giving you the same type of tribute as client, I want to make sure you understand that I am appreciative for your time um, because you don't have to be doing this. And you show that by bringing flowers or a card or taking that extra step, paying for the coffee, whatever else. Um, and those are also just, kind of old school, unfortunately, manners, but also just basic polite manners for when you're meeting anyone. If you're going to someone's house, you normally bring some sort of gift. If you, um, 
are going to meet someone new or you're going to meet someone who is maybe going to assist you with something in your life that is not, again, is something that's one-sided. There, There's not a huge benefit for them doing it for you. You should show your appreciation, um, especially if that person is not someone in your intimate circle. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Silver Lana, Sex Workers United, for real though. It should all be legal. Yep. Jade Love, I'm so glad that you were appreciative for the advice and that it was helpful. Again, message me if you have any other questions and we can uh, delve into it more because I, I unfortunately was not able to find a mentor. So I had to do a lot of stuff myself, teach myself a lot of things. And I'm still teaching myself things and... Um, <clears throat> interviewing with other femdoms or talking to other femdoms, uh, pro femdoms and how to get work and more clients. And so I'm still learning, learning things as I go, as I go along. But that is um, from my, you know, <clears throat> years worth of research. Um, that, that is, that is the advice I would give you to start. We got eight people in the live chat tonight. That's the most we've ever had. Yay. Um, so, hold on. Uh, Jamara said, stupid question. No questions are stupid, but is your wardrobe all black or mostly black? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by mostly. Do I have items that are not black? Yes. Are they maybe a shade of, black. Shade of <laughs> gray? Yeah. Um, and then... I have a few things that are white and red, uh, pops of red. Yeah, pops of red. But no, I'm I'm pretty much goth goddess. I like all black all the time. It makes it nice and easy. Yeah, I think most of mine are black. Well, I have some colored shirts I throw out just to just to show that he I am does not wear anything but <laughs> black pants, a black V neck, and a black button up over the top. We are it's easy that way. Goth mix couple till yes. we die. I love black and gray and red. Yeah, it's like the color palette for like my whole life. I love it. It works so great um, for, I mean, it's also dungeon colors. Yeah. But those have always been my colors. I've loved that. I think, I'm trying to think of when I went full all, I think I went all black while I was in Tampa. It was like my first year, it was like I had moved, I was living at home with my parents for about a year. And I remember when I had moved there, I was buying a lot of bright colored clothes because I had like a little fashion vlog. But I think by the time I left there and went to go move down um, with with a guy I dated while I was down there, that I had started transitioning to the, to the all black wardrobe. And by the first year in Tampa, I think I was all black all the time. <laughs> um, so the other thing we were going to talk about was I had to cut rope this last week for the first time and by cut rope um, if you guys are new to my channel I am a shibari kimbaku artist rigger um, I do a lot of rope and so I was doing I do a lot of suspension and I was doing rope suspension with a close friend um, play partner we play when, when we have time when we when I'm at places and we negotiate it like um, but we haven't done rope in a while. And so we did some suspension and <clears throat> I will admit in the beginning of the tie, there was a lot of chitter chatter going on in the social. So I was talking and it wasn't necessarily that, um, I was a little distracted, not distracted where I was doing going on. I wasn't tying. So when I was tying, I was focused on it, but I was like, uh, it took some time. <laughs> like it just took longer than, than normal. Cause I'm, I'm actually getting faster at some of my my ties um but anyway she went up and we moved a couple just a few quick transition not real quick but like transitions with the legs and then I wanted to um adjust her chest harness so she would go up a little bit more a little bit more at the chest harness and I was trying to decide to go up or down and I didn't feel that I had quite enough on her low on the lower part of the body to go full down um, to take the chest harness all the way down. So she just behind that. Uh, and so I decided to go up. Um, I tried to adjust a few things to see like, hey, do you think this is going to be okay? She thought it was going to be okay. And so I made the transition. During the transition, the rope uh, tensioned and um, 
got tighter around her underneath her rib cage by her lungs. And so she unfortunately um, started to panic a little bit, felt like she couldn't breathe. And so we needed to come down. And as we, I had uh, started to hold She's a very tiny girl. So I had started to hold her up a little bit um, to take some of the pressure off of her chest. And at, once I got into that position, I kind of needed to stay in that position. And so I very quickly sought help. Um, from other people in the, and there were other people already kind of watching, paying attention to what was going on. But um, I was like, Hey, can, we're going to need to cut this down. Um, actually, I don't even think I suggested, I think uh, Rev actually was like, are we going to cut? And we we're trying to, we we're waiting for a response to her, whether she was going to be able to wait, wait to get it untied. And then she kind of, yeah, no, we need to cut because she was panicking, panicking. Um, and so I had a couple other people come over so that we could hold her up. Um, you never want to just, cut someone. You don't want them to drop. You need people underneath them to hold them. Um, so you need to be aware of those things too when you don't have other people in the room when you're tying. Um, sometimes pushing up and taking pressure off of certain things is a better idea than just chopping somebody down. So we ended up, I cut her down and uh, we cut some of it off, but she was able to wait for us to tie some of it off. And um, like always, when you cut rope, the <laughs> She's immediately like apologetic, like felt bad for having to cut my rope, which it's rope. Rope are like five to 10 bucks a bundle. And um, my Nawashi actually has a great policy where if you get your rope from them and you have to cut rope, they uh, most of the time will replace it for free. And so um, I was able to get new rope very easily. And that was a, it wasn't, wasn't a big issue. Um, got her calmed down, water everything um so i could go back and talk to her a little bit more about it and that's when we got back to it, it, it we and discussed it we realized that <clears throat> um i realized that in that situation that maybe i should have come down instead of gone up um or called it sooner and um she was realizing that she maybe just kind of panicked um as well and so great learning lesson i now have some rope that's all cut up that i think i'm going to make into a little art project, memory project of, of uh, a good way to remember and learn. I'm so glad she was a close friend so that we were able to kind of comfortably negotiate, like talk it out and um, figure out what, what went on. And I was glad that I had good friends around me to help um, help with dealing with the situation and uh, support me. So I also didn't, you know, crumble because you get hard on yourself when you have to cut rope or something happens uh, with the bottom um, and can be discouraging. But I've got some good people in my life, which is positive. Let's see. Yeah, rope, um, Lana, uh, rope is definitely like, it does take more time, but you're like not, you don't think about it when you're doing it. That it's like, oh gosh, it's taking a long time. It's just it's an activity. It's a it's an activity you share with this person. It's like um, it does take more time, but that's kind of the 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 part that I enjoy the most is that they're focusing on you, and you're being focused on this. Like you two are sharing an extended time. It's artistic. It's 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 um, individualized because it's not just take any old paddle against you. Basically, basically the, the top has to basically design their art around your body. And that, you know, I think that's more of a connection thing right there. Um, yeah, it takes more time, but I, the, and just when, when you go up, it's fun. When you come down, that's when the, you know, the cortisol goes down, the endorphins are, are going, even if it's not endorphins, because sometimes it's not, you know, uh, sadistic or anything, but just the whole floaty space you get into is just wonderful. So yeah, it does take more time, but it's, I think it's worth it. Um, I definitely think it's worth it too. It does like any doing anything well takes time. Um, anyways, and practice and, and learning, but the, it, it reaps so many rewards when you have that just really good, you know, suspension or tie and everything goes smoothly and your bottom's super happy and it worked out the way you wanted it to. And you're just like, oh, that's the best feeling ever. Um, and you can get a similar feeling when you're doing spanking. It's just different. You know, it's just like um, needles is going to be a different, you know, 
a different yeah. uh, high than rope may be, spanking may be. They're going to be different, but um, there's a lot of a lot of rewarding aspects of rope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think with spanking and needles, the intensity is 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 up front. Um, when you're hit, all of a sudden you feel it. With rope, it's it yeah, it's yeah, it's different. It's a different experience. The the confinement, the control. Um, if I feel like there's some build up. There's some build up. There's a sur there's a moment of surrender where you basically you're kind of whatever they want you to be, and I that's one of the benefits of that. But that's why people are in a bondage. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, see it. Someone mentions like meditation. It is meditation. Yeah, definitely for both the yeah. top and the bottom. Um, I was in the scene when I found my partner. So fashion uh, lover Tiffany said, were you into the scene before you met your current partner or after? If after, how did you tell him that this is what you'd like to do? No, uh, he we met because he was a client. Yeah. Now, I wasn't in the scene before I met her. So no. she was my first introduction into BDSM, kink, and all that. Um, I knew that I wanted to experiment in this. Um so most of my, a lot of it was education for me. Um, uh, so I think, well, even then, I think as far as your question, how to tell them what you'd like, I think even though I wasn't a part of the scene, I still had that want. So it wasn't like I needed persuasion. Yeah. <laughs> no, he found me. Yeah. Um, but if you do have to tell someone with that, I think, again, I'm going to go back to being your authentic self yeah. for the m more of your life than you are not is more rewarding than the heartbreak of losing somebody who isn't going to make you happy and living yeah. inauthentically. Yeah. You know, honesty is very important. I did pop his king cherry. Yes. I've popped many of his cherries. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that too much? <laughs> You've popped some of mine too. <laughs> it's the truth. I'm honest. Um, all right. If we have any other questions, let's go ahead and get them in the chat because we're going to wrap up here in the next few minutes. Um, we are going to fire uh, in a couple of weeks, like I mentioned before, and then October we'll be going to rope craft. So if you're interested in those things, I will try to put links to them in the description down below. And if you happen to go to any of those events, please find me when you're there and let me know that you found out about it on my channel. I would love to meet you. Um, let's see. Jade Love said, are there any reasons a dominatrix would turn a person down and not be your mentor? Yep, many. <laughs> Many reasons. Uh, they could not have time. They could not want to mentor. They could have mentored people before and those people have screwed them over, like stealing clients, not showing up on time, being unreliable, unappreciative. They um, may not care for your personality when they meet you. There's a lot of reasons why they may say no. And I will be honest, don't be discouraged. Continue to find research and community if you don't get the responses you want. But part of the reason why I don't have a mentor is because people were not willing to mentor. I did reach out to people. Um, I did offer them services and all the things that I told you to offer and did not still get the same response that I wanted. Um, so again, don't be discouraged by that. Um, but that is just an aspect of the fact that it's, it's volunteer time. It, it, they're volunteering that and that knowledge and some, uh, not everyone, uh, not everyone comes from the same place of just wanting to share and 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 grow people and want to be an educator and teach and and that's perfectly fine. Some people are there for the business. Um, you know, some women might think you're a threat. There's many other things that can happen. But if that's something you really want to do, you can push through those things and you do that by just remaining polite. Um, you know, keep your commitment, stay on time, be appreciative, be grateful, learn what you can. And uh, and then also know when you're going to you may have to take something in your own hands and be like, all right, well, you're going to be the dominant. Right. You're you're creating your dominatrix business is actually a good opportunity for you to practice your dominating skills and being able to uh, say make decisions, trust those decisions, persevere, 
um, persevere, have people tell you no and figure out another way to do it, being able to tell other people no and um, and how, you know, how to do that in the best way. Uh, it, it, it is all kind of a journey and you're going to learn how you want to deal with certain situations as you as you go along that journey. But again, at the end of the day, remember that if you're going to want to run your own dominatrix services and businesses, you're ultimately the last person in charge. So there's not someone else that you can you can go to people for help, but you're the one that makes the decision on whether you want to take that client, use that dungeon, be be partnered with this other person, be connected with this business, whatever else. Those are your decisions. And if you're not ready for that type of entrepreneurship, then again, I would I, I would make sure that you're focusing more on your skills until you're ready for that. Mm -hmm that responsibility um, because it is going to be you managing everything. If a client needs a receipt for something or it, it, like you've got to come up with that and, and come off uh, very professional. So there's a lot more that goes into it than just knowing how to swing a flogger. Um, and there are going to be roadblocks and you will, that is part of what's going to build, build your character and your journey is figuring out how to get around this. And, you know, that's another benefit of community is that when you're in the community, you know, if, if, even though you're not a, a dominatrix per se, you can still find individuals to talk and you can practice and they'll, you can learn from them and they'll give you feedback. So even before you actually become a, a business, you already have some experience with how the bottom feels, how they react, um, how to deal with different personality types. Um, you'll get good advice. Um, just by being in the community, and that's I think is a good um, bridge into doing this professionally. Also, sorry, someone asked me to put the links to the events that I was mentioning um, in the chat. So I'm going to do that for you guys really quick. Here's the other one that starts. That's in October. So they're both great to check out. So, okay, I think um, we are going to go ahead and wrap this up. This was a great chat. Uh, the last, I mean, all my chats have been great, uh, but last week was we had so many great questions, great questions this week, and it's great to see some more people in the chat. It's like, I'm so grateful that and excited that people uh, care what I have to say or, or want to talk about these things more. And so um, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Hopefully you guys will be enjoying more of the content I'm putting out. We have more videos coming out from our kinky road trip um, this week. And then also an educational video will be coming out. Um, I've uh, got the next part of my slave dance series, at least filmed, just make it edited. Um, so those are all be coming out this week and please uh, comment, check them out, give me feedback. If you have any suggestions for videos or topics you'd like me to make videos on or talk about, leave those in the comments. I check those all the time and I will make videos if you suggest um, a topic. Um, also, follow me on my social media, the MP Experience, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, you can also follow me at Madam Posh if you'd like. And what other things? Oh, Patreon. If you want to get more content, uh, there are scenes with me and my gentleman, scenes with me and my pet. Uh, there is interviews, some rope tutorials, tons of additional content on Patreon. And um, I would really, really appreciate people's support on Patreon and it will help support this channel so I can bring more content out for you guys. Oh, it looks like my battery is about to die too on my computer because I forgot to plug it back in. Hold on, let's just fix that problem really quick so I'm not rushed. Okay. Um, so please feel free to check out my Patreon um, and subscribe. There are different subscription levels and any level that you uh, subscribe to, I will be appreciative. And thank you, uh, Silver Lana, for posting that. Uh, she is one of my first official Patreons and she's been so, uh, so sweet. We've been messaging throughout the last week make sure she can see all those videos. Uh, right now, actually too, if you join Patreon right now, I think almost, if you, I think you get access to almost everything right now. I have adjusted most of the post. So even if you just get like the five or $10 thing, you can watch all of the content for a short amount of time until I change it back. So if you wanna see all of it, for uh for a cheaper subscription level check out patreon now <laughs> uh because i'm i will probably adjust it back uh, halfway through august uh when i put some more content up there so again thank you guys so much again so appreciative this is really fun i like that you guys have questions for my gentleman too because that gives him an opportunity to talk <laughs>
<laughs> they have something to talk about. And I love hearing his answers as well, because these are sometimes questions I don't ask him. Um, and so you guys are great for, for doing that. I appreciate it. Did you want to say goodbye to everyone? <laughs> Did you let me rephrase that? Did you have any last words before our audience leaves us? Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you and bye-bye. I will see you guys in the next one. Have a good night. Happy kinking. It's been Madam Posh and Bound Mystic with the MP Experience and Bound Lamb. Adios. And now we awkwardly try to end the stream. Try to end the stream. Have a good night. <laughs>